and start it. So, received a question recently about the relationship of Christians and Jews and what's going on with that. I'm Pastor Dave Couyers of Country Bible Church in Greater Downtown Boonville, California. And I won't be publishing this on SlideShare because I'm out of room, but we will put it on YouTube. So, And one of the questions that I've come up with uh, is, do Christians become Jews when we get saved? And I thought that's an interesting quandary that we're going to take a little time to look at. And the second question, part of that question is, do Jews become Gentiles when they become a Christian? So what's going on with this relationship between Christians and Jews? So the first thing with any tough question you need to, that you get is you need to define the terms, especially if you're dealing with a, another religion or a cultist or whatever. Find out what they mean by the blood. Find out which Jesus they're talking about. Find out those kinds of questions and, and identify the terms that you're using. So we're going to look at what do you mean by Christian or Jew? Uh, and then how, when, who, why, and did God separate out the Jews? We're going to take a brief look at that. And then how, when, who, why did God separate out the Christians? And, but first we're going to start with a brief history of all humanity, okay, from, from Adam and Eve on. To get the get the focus on where we are. So, from the creation of Adam to the flood was 1,656 years, and I can show you the math on that. And there's no room for fudge in it, as near as I can tell. It's rock solid. Um, and then at the flood, all the other genetic information, all the other bloodlines, uh, Cain and all of his descendants, God erased them all. And only Noah and his three sons and their four wives survived the flood. This is a little bit interesting because now with DNA evidence, they've proven that all the male genetic information goes back to a, uh, a several thousand years ago, about 4,000 years ago, to one man. But the woman DNA goes way past that, another few thousand years and many generations. Well, why would that be? Why? Why? Because all of the other male DNA got wiped out at the flood. Everybody that got off Noah's boat was a descendant of one man. But the four wives have three different streams that continue out from that, and they come from different bloodlines. So, um, it, of course, science tries to say, well, see, God's a, God's a female, and it's... <laughs> no, no, it's the story of Noah's flood, and it's true. So everyone after the flood comes from the blood zyme of three men, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives. And it, especially there in Genesis 9, verses 18 and 19. So Les Feldwick, and I don't know him, uh, did a Bible timeline. Going back with Adam, about 4,400 4, years, 4,004 years B.C., and then 15, 1,656 years later, we got the flood of Noah, around 2350, and we're going to continue. We're going to use this a few times today. So, every family scattered at Babel comes from the bloodlines of Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their three wives. This is crucial. When you get those questions, well, why are there so many races? Where do all the races come from? There's only one race. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're all humans. All humans can interbreed and have children, you know. But what happened was God scattered them at Genesis 11 by families. They went out by families and by tribes. And he confused their languages and sent them the different ways. So the ones that went into the Orient had a little few extra fat cells around their eyes that make their eyes look uh, less open than ours. Uh, the sons of Ham went down more into Egypt and they have a little darker skin color. Uh, the ones that Japheth went more up into Europe and we get the fairer skins where it's colder climate and less sun. You need to receive more of the sun's light. And the Lord sovereignly, we're going to get to this when we get to Genesis, uh, Ezekiel 38, 39 real soon. We see that God then takes the children and the grandchildren, especially of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that's where he names all of the nations where they went. So virtually all of the biblical names of territories 
come from the grandsons of Noah. But then God zooms in his focus on only the descendants of Shem at Genesis 11.10. So it's like the rest of the world gets set aside, if you would, and he just focuses his attention on the bloodline of Shem. Then God resumes his focus in only again on, only on the descendants of Abram, who becomes Abraham in Genesis 12.1. And Abraham, even though the Jews don't like to hear it, was an idol-worshipping Gentile. His father was an idol-worshipping Gentile from, from Babylon area. So, so, but the sons of Jacob, who got his name changed into Israel after Egypt. Genesis 12, 2, God says, I will make you, Abraham, a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And this re promise is re reiterated over and over and over again in the Old Testament. So three points. God says I'm going to, in, in Genesis 1 through 3 especially, he says I'll make, give you a seed, give you a land, and give you a blessing. Three Three points of the uh, Abrahamic promise and covenant. And this is a unilateral covenant. A bilateral covenant is when you do this, I'll do that. This is a unilateral covenant, more like a will and testament, only you don't have to die for it. Uh, this is one-sided. The only thing that is dependent on this promise that God would make Abraham a, a great nation, the only condition would be the validity of God the honesty of God, if he's a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God, and he is. So there's no conditions for it. One-sided, unilateral covenant. Then we skip along to about 1445 B.C., and we come to Mount Sinai. With the, so they go into um, Egypt, the descendants of Jacob, who got his name changed to Israel. They went into Egypt for 400 years, and... They went in about 70 people, and they came out a multitude, uh, probably over 2 million men. Um, but then God gathers them all at the foot of Mount Sinai, and there they become a nation. Moses actually comes down off the mountain carrying the, the constitution, if you would, of the um, eloquent, I think it was Chuck Mister you say, he didn't come down just with two tablets of stone. He came down with drawings underneath his arm for the, for the whole deal. Exodus 19, verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Remember, this is Israel. His name is Jacob. God, in Genesis 35, changed his name to Israel. So... What is the purpose of this? Why did God carve out this one nation to be his priests of a holy nation? Very unique, very distinct. What's going on with all the rules and regulations that they've got, the circumcision and the dietary restrictions and the on and on and on law? Because God wants them to be a holy nation, uniquely his, set apart from the people. And their job duty is a kingdom of priests. They were to be God's priests to the whole world so that people would see the holiness of Israel, desire to ha understand and know more about the living God, and then come to him. So, so that moves us along. We were at Adam, the creation. We got to the flood, Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, Abraham chapter 12. Then we get to Moses and the law. He puts 1500 B.C. It's about 1445 B.C. King David is around 1000 B.C. Um, and then the Babylonian captivity around uh, 606 to 597. So let's continue to define terms. So what do we mean by Christian or Jew? We took a look at uh, why did God separate out the Jews so how, when, why, and did God separate out the Christians? What's, what's happening there? What's going on? Why? And so that happens here uh, after the cross, after the ascension, and Acts chapter 2. We find out the, uh, the Christians. And these are my red arrows, not, not his. Um, 
So why? Well, they weren't called Christians until much later. By the time we get to Acts 11.26, it says for an entire year they met the church and taught considerable numbers and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So here they're referred to as the church. You'll find them also referred to as the way, uh, and, and, and they're called a sect of Judaism, lots of other things. But until they finally, finally established the name as Christians, or Christ followers, or little Christ, if you would. But the, the, Acts, uh, the church started in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And the unique thing is the permanent sealing of the Holy Spirit on all believers. Everyone there who's believed in Jesus Christ received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, if you were to flip back in the New Testament, get to the Gospel of John, uh, round 11, uh, chapter 11, 17, there Jesus made a promise that um, the Holy Spirit is with you and he will be in you. Major distinction here. So the disciples at all the time in the four Gospels were reading about him, they were not yet sealed with the Holy Spirit. It was, the Holy Spirit was with them like he was with many of the Old Testament prophets, but he wasn't. they weren't sealed by it. They weren't indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Um, that's unique to the church. Acts 11.15, Peter says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. Okay, there's a lot in that verse. What does Peter mean by at the beginning? He's saying Jews and Gentiles just got saved the same way when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Okay, that's a, I should have looked it up in the Greek, but it's a passive. When something falls on you, it's something that happens to you, not something you did, right? So the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and then he says, just as he did upon us at the beginning. I have a vigorous debate going with a pastor in Coeur d'Alene area, and they are a mid-Acts church, and they deny that the church started in Acts chapter 2. And I pose this question, what about Acts 11.15? What's he mean at the beginning? The beginning of what? Can only mean at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. The best I could get out of him was, huh, that's a really good point. Yeah, duh. You're disagreeing with 2,000 years of Christianity when you say that it you didn't start at the beginning. Uh, another interesting point in this simple verse is just as he did upon us at the beginning. References to the Holy Spirit are mostly masculine singular. Uh, and I had a, um, a witnessing exchange with a young lady here a week ago, two weeks ago, who referred to the Holy Spirit as it. She's coming out of the Pentecostal side. And they oftentimes refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. And the JWs will refer to him as an it also. The JWs say he's like that impersonal force in the electrical cord over there. He's a powerful force, but he's impersonal. He just uh, is not, not a person. But the Bible disagrees with him. It's always he did. He teaches. He speaks. He leads. He converts. He you know, indwells. He does lots of things. So. so why did God separate out the Christians? Why, why do the, you know, God had the Judaism set up for a long time and uh, 1,400 years, what's the deal with it? You know, 1,000 years, he kind of set them aside. And, and 2 Maccabees tells us that for the silent 450 years, there was no prophet in the land. So, so they were kind of, kind of set aside there. But when Jesus comes on the scene, he treats them as God's representatives. So why did God continue then to separate even farther from them? Well, because national Judaism had become apostate. And when you see the Jews in most of the Gospels, it's referring to national Judaism. Uh, and I received a rebuke from a, a fellow Israeli supporter lady that years ago, 
And she, she said I was anti-Semitic. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I love Israel. I've been there twice and I support them. And, um, but because I had referred to the fact that God had separated himself from the Jews. And I, by that I mean, so whenever you hear me say that, most of the time I'm talking about the religion, the national Judaism, the, the uh, political religious end of Judaism. And they had become apostate, and Jesus cuts them no slack. John 8, 44, he says to him, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Who was the first murderer? This is the interactive portion of our presentation. Who was the first murderer in the Bible? No. According to Jesus, it was Satan with Adam and Eve. On the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And he deceived them, and they died spiritually that very day. But the first physical murder, yeah, you're right. He goes on in Matthew 23, verse 1, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all they tell you, you do to do, te, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all these deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and strengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at the banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher and you are all brothers. So Jesus cuts them no slack. He just puts their sins right on the public uh, confrontation there. So who are we talking about when he says he called out Christians? Church is everyone. After Acts 2, nobody before that who's been filled with the Holy Spirit, whose teacher is Jesus, who is born again. So the church starts in Acts 2. There the names change, very unique names. We're called the church the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, disciples of Jesus, and a few others, the way, and a few other names for um, believers. But Matthew 23, 8, Jesus says, Do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. So a unique new nation, Jews and Gentiles, has been created at Pentecost, uh, and we're all brothers. We're all co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not only your Lord and Savior, Creator and God, he's also your brother at this point. And we will be like him eventually. Romans eight seventeen, Paul says, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So, you know, we gave the song about... Uh, I no longer, this world is not my home. Well, it's because we've got a better home. We already own a piece of all of eternity. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. He's gone and prepared a better place for us. And we're just eagerly awaiting that he will come and take him to himself. Galatians 4, 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. So what a promise, unimaginable. You know, Second Corinthians or First Corinthians two nine says that you can't even eye is not ear, ear is not heard, eye is not seen. Neither has it entered into the mind of man what God has in store for him yet future. That's a rough paraphrase, but another major point that you're going to find confused all over Christianity is that ch the church is not Israel. Uh, they, everywhere in the Old Testament, that you know, huge block of Christianity, everywhere they see Israel in the Old Testament, they think church. So they 
acquire for themselves all of the blessings of Israel in the Old Testament and all of the curses they leave on Israel. So it's pretty handy and convenient for them. They don't take any of the curses, they take all of the blessings, and they say all of those references to national Israel and personal Jacob Israel and everything else that is promised in the Old Testament is actually the church. It's like, no, church is not yet. Jesus said, I will, in Matthew 18, I will, yet future meaning, build my church, meaning that it hadn't been built yet, but it would at Acts 2. So the church in Israel have different beginnings, mission, different gifting, different time frames that they deal with, a different destiny, a different purpose, and the names and titles are completely different. There's no commingling between Israel and the church in the Bible. Remember that the church started in Acts chapter 2 and it was 100% Jewish for decades. Like 20 years or so. No Gentiles in it. So the book of Acts deals with about a 30-year transition period between Judaism and the complete establishment of the church and the planting of the church all over the nations. And in that 30-year period, the first part of it, all the way up to chapter 15 of Acts, deals only with the Jews. In fact, a debate arose among the Gentiles without forcing them to, about forcing that should be about forcing them to convert to Judaism. So there was a debate, a vigorous debate, a strong debate between the apostles about do Gentiles have to convert to Judaism in order to be part of the church? Big deal. Do you have to keep the law? 613 commandments the rabbis have sifted out of the Old Testament. And those 613 commandments have to be kept to be a Jew. And they were trying to impose that on the Gentile converts. You can read about it in Acts 15, verse 33. But, but Peter says in Acts 15, verse 10, Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are also. So he almost reversed it. He, he, he never once says, the Gentiles are saved just the way we were. He says, no, he reverses it and says that they're saved just as we are. So it's kind of a reversal almost. But the point is the same. It's only by grace that we're saved. It is by grace you are saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it's a gift of the Lord that no man should boast. So it's grace that saves, and we're going to get to that on another slide, so I won't go there right now. Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Galatians, starting in Galatians 2, when Paul has to rebuke Peter for separating himself from the, from the, uh, uh, from the Gentiles when the Jews come around, and Paul rebukes him to his face over it. And Galatians has a lot of that in here. So do not be subject to a yoke of slavery again. Do not put yourself back under the law, he's saying. You know, it's, it's burdensome. And neither our, us nor our fathers are able to carry it. So we're not burdened with Israel's law. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Why would he refer to the law as the law of sin and death? What's the most common punishment for most of the breaking the law? Cut off from your people. Karat in the Hebrew. And it can mean separated from them or executed by them. Either way, it comes up frequently. But if you're separated from them and they're the only means of salvation, that's as bad as death is the way I see it. So they're cut off from the law. Uh, John 8, 36, Jesus says, So if the Son of Man makes you free, you will be free indeed. Praise God. Romans 8, 9, 
However, if you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Okay, we've got some interesting points made in this little Romans 8 passage. It's the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Okay, we kind of knew that. We also knew that Christ is in you. But did you realize also that the Father's in you? There's other verses also that indicate that the Father's in you. The spirit of him who raised God, Christ from the dead, dwells in you. So I thought it was interesting to have all three of them in this one little passage. Uh, which reminds me, there's a story, uh, a nurse is trying to uh, listen to the heart of a little four-year-old girl. And she's just chattering and chattering away to the nurse, and, and the nurse is trying to listen to her stethoscope, and she goes, uh, nurse finally tells her, says, shh, be quiet. I want to see if Barney's in there. The little girl says, no, Barney's on my underpants. Jesus is in my heart. <laughs> so... You know, but that's kind of the deal. We all kind of focus on Christ in you because that comes up so much in the New Testament and even that the Spirit dwells in you. But there's only a couple verses that indicate that the Father is in you as well. Uh, Billy Gilham one of the, says, One of the best kept secrets in Christianity is that God accepts us. True, he can't stand our sinful acts, but he loves us. He doesn't have us on performance-based acceptance he has us on Jesus-based acceptance. And isn't that the way you do it with your kids also? Do you only love your kids because of what they do or who they are? Who they are, right? They're your child. So same thing with Christianity. Once you become a child of God, John 1.12, uh, you are then loved because of who you are, not what you do. So do Christians become Jews when, when saved? I say absolutely not. Acts 15 completely removes this possibility. In other words, you don't have to keep the 613 commandments. You don't have to do all of the feasts and the ceremonies and the religious rituals and keep two refrigerators, one for meat and one for milk. Are you kidding me? Uh, first trip to Israel, I wasn't aware of their kosher laws. I was a new believer. And a big five-star hotel they took us to and having a beautiful meal, evening dinner, and had coffee afterwards. And, uh, but they, there's no, no cream for my coffee. I really like cream in my coffee, especially after a nice meal. And so finally I flagged over one of the young wait waiters or t teenagers, high schoolers or college kids and told them, I need some cream for my coffee. Uh, he looks at me and goes, okay, Psh, disappears. No cream comes back. I wave over another one. Come on over. I need some cream for my coffee. Uh, uh, okay. Psh, disappears towards the kitchen. Finally, the third one comes by. I go, I need some cream for my coffee. He kind of bends over and whispers to me, you have to go up to the bar to get that. You can't have meat and milk in the same meal because of Genesis 18. <laughs> no, because of one of the rules in Deuteronomy that you're not to boil the kid in the mother's milk is what the verse says. And they've taken that to mean you can't have meat and milk in the same meal. And what they do is they ignore what Father Abraham did with when Jehovah came to him. Remember, two Jehovah and two angels at the trees of Mamre come up to Father Abraham. What did he fix for him? Milk and meat in the same meal. But anyway, so we don't have to worry about all those rules and regulations because we've been freed from the law of sin and death. However, Revelation 5.5, 5, one of the elders said to me, Apostle John, stop weeping. Behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. So Jesus was, is, and will forever be a Jew for all eternity. He, he became 
a human and will remain a human for all eternity. The only thing man made in heaven are the scars. He beheld a lamb looking as he'd been slain, John tells us in the book of, in chapter 5. So, this idea that Jesus was a rabbi, but now he's not, no, he clearly still is. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you need to remember that we are betrothed to a Jewish rabbi. So, in Revelation 19.7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has become come, and his bride has made herself ready. And that's us, guys. So, We've got a Jewish husband, if you would, and who is still the line of the tribe of Judah, the king of the Jews. Of course, he has to be a Jew to be the king of the Jews, right? So, do Jews become Gentiles when they become a Christian? Let me explain to you. I'm, uh, my mother was a Norwegian. Her family line came from Norway. And my father's line came from Holland. My great-grandfather was an immigrant from Holland. So my bloodline is uh, Norwegian and, and Dutch. That didn't change the, day that changed the day that I became a child of God. Same heritage. If you're Italian and you get saved, you remain an Italian. If you are a Russian and you get saved, you remain a Russian. If you are a Jew, you remain a member of the Israelis, a Jew. Okay, But the religious practices change. There's a lot of confusion about it. We're going to look at it now with the Messianic movement. And some of them are practically apostate. Paul was still a Jew. Romans 11.1, 1, he says, And I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. Meganoita. This is the strongest negative you can come up with. It's a double negative. Some translations have God forbid. Uh, I, I had my brother in church one day and, and I tried to explain to him about Meganoita and he finally jumped up and he goes, why don't they just translate it what it is? It's like because there's so many translations of Meganoita. I go, I just told you what it is. It's Meganoita <laughs> in the Greek. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul here doesn't sound like he thinks he... He gave up his citizenship as a Jew. He just became a completed Jew in Jesus Christ. He became born again. So you can't possibly change where you were born. You can't change your national identity. You can be like us, ambassadors to a foreign country, but you can't change where you were born. Romans 10, 12, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. So, so it's still God's nation, Israel. In the first century, Jesus turned his back on national Judaism and has set it aside for almost 2,000 years now. I used to play chess. And in, in chess matches, we have a, a, a time clock. And it's a time clock. If you hit it on your side, it shuts off your clock and it starts clicking the time off on your opponent's time, uh, clock. And when he gets done and makes his move, he reaches over as quick as he can and slaps the time clock and lets the counter start ticking off on your time. And it goes back and forth like this. Or I used to shoot speed rounds in archery. Same thing again. You whop and the target pops up on the opponent's. He hits it with an arrow, pops back up on my side, and it goes back and forth like that. And that's kind of what God's done here. Remember I told you that the Jews were God's priests, but they got so apostate that he had to set them aside. And instead, we are a kingdom of priests, it says now in 1 Peter. So we are now the priests that God's using. He's kicked it over on our time clock, and our time is winding down. You are losing out on a wonderful opportunity if you're not sharing the gospel with somebody real frequently. For all eternity, there's one thing that you're never going to be able to do again. You're never going to be able to witness to a lost sinner again. So this opportunity is now. Seize the opportunity. Go find a lost sinner somewhere and practice on them. You'll get better at it. So 
National Judaism has been set aside. Let me remind you again, 100% of the early church was entirely Jewish. Paul, we just went through it, was a Jew. So it wasn't the Jews that were set aside. It was National Judaism that had to be taken out of the circuit. But it's not the end of National Israel's story. It's yet future. Jesus said to Israel's leader in, in Matthew 23, 39, For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he's quoting one of the Psalms. He's talking about Yahweh. Okay? And he didn't say, you will never see me again. He said, you will not see me until. I tell the folks, every until you get to in the Bible, I want you to circle it, highlight it, put a line around it or something, because they're really crucial. Until means that it was a condition for a period of time, and then a new condition prevailed. So if I say, I haven't eaten a thing, I, I hadn't eaten a thing until lunch, you can know that I didn't eat anything until lunch, and then that condition changed. I went ahead and ate. When Jesus says, you will not see me until, he's telling them that there is a time in the future when you will see me again. And a very specific requirement for the second coming is that national Israel says, Baruch haba Basham Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They said it at the triumphal entry. You remember what the rabbis said about that? Rabbi, tell your disciples to stop blaspheming. Why did they think that the, the, at the palm, at palm full, triumphal entry with the palms, why did they think that was blasphemy? Because they're talking about God in the flesh being before them. And what did Jesus say? He says, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll make them stop right away. They're blaspheming. That's not right. Is that what he said? No. He says, if they ceased, the very stones would cry out. If, if you ever are blessed enough to get to go to Israel, one of the things that they're guaranteed to take you on is they'll take you up to the Mount of Olives uh, and take you down the trail. It's the ancient trail, 2,000-year-old trail that Jesus rode down on the donkey into Jerusalem on the triumphal entry. And I highly recommend, Chuck Missler used to recommend, along the way, pick up one of those stones that didn't cry out and take it home and mount it up on a plaque. I've got one in my box at home. If you ever want to see one of the stones that didn't cry out. And I take them literally. I believe if, if the disciples would have stopped at that point, the stones would have cried out. Probably with the splitting open. But anyway, let's not go there. So God is not done with Israel. Very, very clear, lots of places. Uh, so after Matthew 23, 39 is completed, once the national Israel cries out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, at the end of, after seven years of great tribulation, Jesus, Jesus used this term, Jesus will come and rescue national Israel from the coming one world leader and set up his father's kingdom. So national Israel is going to be, you know, read Matthew 24 if you want to find out about it. You know, they're going to, they're, Jesus tells them, flee when you see the abomination set up in the holy place, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the reader understand, flee. Get out of town. Run to the mountains. Don't stop. Don't go up on top and get your coat. Don't go back in for your money. Just run. It's that urgent. That's what Jesus is telling them. Why? Coming world leader is going to wipe them all out. That's his goal. Satan's inspired them to kill off every last Jew. Jesus says, flee to the mountains. We believe they'll go to Basra, most likely Petra, and they will be supernaturally protected there from him. So that's what's going on. And then Jesus will have the sheep and goat judgment, and then he's going to set up the millennial kingdom, the Father's kingdom. Father's kingdom will last for a thousand years, according to Revelation. It uses that term six times in Revelation 20. Um, and then it will continue on for all eternity. Leviticus 24, verse 8. Every Sabbath day, he, the priest, shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It is an 
Everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. If God says something is an everlasting covenant, how long do you think it'll last? Just for the thousand years? No. On into the new heavens and new earth. The Lord's got stuff in store for us that we can't uh, even begin to imagine. Why would he have sacrifices after the cross? Why do we have communion once a month? As a remembrance, right? Why will they be doing the blood sacrifices and all the things? Because God says you're going to do it forever. And also as a remembrance, looking back at the cross. We look back at the cross now. But there's a coming time when we will also engage in the sacrifices. Jesus also yearned and looked forward to this coming kingdom. Luke twenty two fifteen, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again. What's that word? Until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So the until again means that he is, right now he's not eating this, but there is going to be a millennial kingdom where they will eat the Passover. What, did the, what was the meat in the Passover? The Paschal lamb, right? So we know that there is going to be butchering of animals in the millennial kingdom, at least. Once we get to the new heavens and new earth, it tells us that there's no longer sin, disease, death, disasters, or even dandruff. So, but there will be blood sacrifices again in the millennial kingdom. And you can see that all through the second half of the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be there. If we can ever get back on track to Ezekiel, we're going to finish up the book of Ezekiel. But the last nine chapters of Ezekiel are all about a temple that's never been built. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. So what happens to national Israel? Well, interesting. I'm glad you asked. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. God says, Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. It will be the time of Jacob's distress. But he, Israel, will be saved from it. Verse 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Then they will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Now when Jeremiah, God tells us through Jeremiah that they will call on my name, I can't help but thinking he's talking about that exact thing. Baruch haba basham Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When they call that out, God says that he will answer, God will answer, and he'll say, they are my people and the Lord, and they will say, the Lord is my God. So what is going on up here? For that day is great. There is none like it. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, around verse 15, a little before or a little after? He says that there's a time coming when if there be no time before it ever or it will, ever will be again. It's that bad. And he says, unless those days were cut short, there would be no flesh saved. That's a prophecy right out of the Lord's mouth that I believe cannot possibly have been filled until our generation. Now we have weapons of mass destruction where if the Lord doesn't cut those days short, we will have weapons of mass destruction that will wipe out all flesh. But what's it say? It's a time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. Israel's going to be saved. Antichrist is not going to make it. He's going to wipe out a lot of them. A lot of them will die. I'm going to show you that. That he's going to sift them like wheat, he says in Ezekiel. So back to uh, Les's timeline here. So we've made it past the start of the church. We made it through the church age. We're at the very end of it, and we're getting here close to the rapture of the church and the second coming. So what happens to national Israel? Jesus, after he comes back and to set up his kingdom, judges the nation, saves Israel, 2532, then what we call the, the sheep and goat judgment. And Jesus says, all the nations, this is the ethnos, the Gentile nations, the goyim, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So we've got a sheep and goat judgment. 
the Gentile nations are all gathered around Jerusalem to him, and he goes through, and we used to have sheep. We used to keep sheep. And there's a, over on Highway 253 there, there's still the, the corral, of, the sheep corral that uh, J the Johnson Rats has. And what they do is they'll have an alleyway that forks. And in this, there's a gate that goes left or right. And as the sheep are coming down, you decide if they're a yearling, a ewe, or a buck, or whatever. And you go flip, flip, and it's just that simple. And the sheep goes to go right past. So Jesus says they're going to have sheep on the right and goats on my left. Saved believers on the right, lost goats on the left. And it's that kind of a separation. But what's he judging them on? Well, that's Matthew 25 is all about. Verse 45, Jesus says, Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Well, we just dealt with all the sheep and the goats. Who's this? least of these group. I believe it's the Jews. 144,000 that have been persecuted by the Antichrist and, their, and the other Jews. And they've been persecuted so badly that they were dying. And they couldn't buy food and they couldn't drink water and on and on and on. And Jesus says, the way you treated these poor Jews, persecuted Jews, ends up showing where your heart's at. And you didn't do it for me or you did do it for me. So, how is national Israel doing? To, how far along are we working on this process? Well, May 14, 1948, a year after I was born, Israel became a nation. Okay? Already all of the preparations for the Third Temple are made. Uh, when we went to Jerusalem on the first trip in 95, they had about 85 or 90 percent of all of the articles for the Third Temple were already made. We actually got to handle the big silver trumpets. Uh, we actually got to smell the incense. They used to do that back in the day. They'd let you open up the jar and let you smell the fragrant incense offering made according to Le Levitical standards, which no one could use except the priests as a fragrant incense offering. Uh, we got to see the golden articles and the shovel pans and all of the stuff that they, 200 and something articles that are made and ready. Now they've got them 100% made. Last time I was there, they, not only that, they had the, the golden menorah there. It's in a glass high security case there right on, on the Temple Mount. And it's beautiful, huge, you know, I forget the weight of gold, but it's mega millions worth of gold that's been donated. And they finally found a Russian craftsman who could make it out of a single piece of gold as they're commanded, and on and on and on. They have all the preparations for the Third Temple. Um, Chuck Missler again said that he got to go to the rabbis and they showed him the plans they have for the third temple. And, uh, and Chuck chuckled and he says, uh, so I bet you've got in there uh, wiring for TV cameras too, huh? And he says, the rabbi just kind of got quiet. He goes, why do you say that? He says, well, because in our Bible, it says all of the world is going to see it when the abomination of desolation happens. And so we know there will be live TV circuits at the Holy of Holies year-round, 24-7. So they're ready. Uh, years ago, they had 200 Jewish boys that had been raised up to be temple priests whose feet had never touched the ground. When they were born, and every time after that, they kept them elevated off the, the ground so they never came in contact with the defiled earth. And... Uh, and they were in training to be temple priests. And they're, they've got them all set. They have also now have the ashes of the blood he red heifer ready to go to purify the third temple. So all 12 tribes are back in the land. And they've done the testing by DNA. So they can now identify all 12 tribes. They've got them all back in significant number. And they're all back in the land. I say much of Ezekiel 36, we're going to be there, I promise you, before too long, uh, is completed. But we await Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you back into your own land. That's going on right now. It's in progress. It's almost completed. Verse 25 hasn't happened. 
Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And you will live in the land. Unconditional covenantal promise of God that he will put Israel back in the land and they will become born again, we would say. That's what's going on here. And God, God puts no contingencies on this. So part of this prophecy is already done. He's been gathering them from the nations. There's millions of them coming out of, out of Russia for the last 20 years. Uh, now he's got plane loads and plane loads coming from, from uh, Ukraine and flying back into the land. People are putting in all over to try and prove their identity. It's interesting. Everywhere in the Bible, the proof that you're a Jew depends on your father's bloodline. Always goes to the father's bloodline. When they became a nation, they realized there's problems with that in that we can't verify now who the father is. But we darn well know who the mother is. So they changed the rules and they made it where you have to prove that your mother or grandmother, one of your grandparents, has Jewish blood in you, and then you can immigrate to Israel. So unconditional covenant promise that God's made to Israel that they will be back in. So the third temple, I'm glad you asked about it. This Q&A came from David uh, Hawking, who's a really good scholar. He received a question, is the third temple the one that Messiah will build? Eh. Our answer, Jewish people often referred to the three temples, Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, and the Messianic temple. However, the biblical material regarding the temple needs to be examined carefully. Go to our website, davidhawking.org, and so on. Uh, there's actually seven temples that I think it's compass.org has got, and I've got a list that I've done uh, of seven temples. One of them is you. you. The Bible says you, everyone who's received Christ, you are the temple of God. And uh, the tabernacle is also basically a temple of God and uh, Hezekiah's temple and so on. What happened with the, what we call the second temple? Uh, uh, Solomon's temple was the first temple. Actually, the tabernacle was the same position, but then Herod's temple, they call it, and that's usually referred to as the second temple, even though it's uh, third or fourth. But if you read in a commentary and they make mention of the second temple, they're talking about the one that Herod rebuilt. And what it was was uh, Nehemiah, and, uh, that temple that was built there, that was, it was, so fell so far short of Solomon's temple that the elders that remembered the old temple after 70 years openly, publicly wept and cried about this new temple that was built. It was that much less of a structure. And so they publicly cried and humiliated themselves over it. Then when Herod comes along, he gets permission. The Jews were smart. They're very smart. And they said, well, you can't tear down our temple. If you want to rebuild it, do a major remodel, you have to do the same thing that they did in my generation in the Bay Area. You couldn't get a building permit to build a new house. But you could buy an old dilapidated house, tear down three of the bedrooms, rebuild those, as long as you left the living room and the kitchen. And then later on, you could get a kitchen remodel permit. You could come in and tear down the kitchen, and then you'd fix up the living room. And so by that process, you never completely removed the old house. You just remodeled it and you ended up with a brand new home. And that's basically what Herod did. They made him leave portions of it and then remodel the rest of it, and they continued to build it that way. And all that was left of Solomon's temple was Solomon's colonnade and the Temple Mount, that 17-acre platform you see on the TV. So. Matthew 24, 15, Jesus said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of, through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. So we're talking about a temple, yet future, Jesus says, yet future, that will have a holy place, the holy of holies. And when you see the abomination standing in that, 
Run. Get out of town. Keep going. Second Thess 2.4, Paul says, the one who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God and object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So I believe that this Antichrist setting up an image, and with AI now that we've got, uh, I don't, I, Eric sent me some good videos on, on the state of AI that we've got now. Don't think that just artificial intelligence is just uh, a really smart computer program. It is that, but it's way more than that. It's a computer program that can reprogram itself and learn and react and respond and write new code for itself. That's what we're coming up against. And when you read what happens with the fatal wound that was healed, an oxymoron if I ever heard it, or an image that speaks and knows when everybody's worshiping it or not, this, we're, we're talking about a level of AI probably that we're not familiar with yet. But anyway, when you see this abomination in the holy place, in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God, then we're getting close to the second coming. Micah 4.1 talks about it. And it will come about when? In the last days. We're here. John says we're here after the first century. Then the mountain of the house of the Lord, meaning the temple, will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. Has that happened yet? Is it going to happen? You betcha. I love this phrase here the mountain of Jehovah, Yahweh, Hashem, to the house of the God of Jacob, the temple. When you're speaking to him, and I've been dealing a lot with Muslims on the phone lately. It just like feels like my whole telephone ministry has become consumed by the robocalls that I get from the Muslims. And they're almost all in Virginia <laughs> on the East Coast. And, uh, and they come from all over the world, but they're primarily all Muslims or ex-Muslims, as near as I can tell. And they want to argue about who Allah is, if God, if the God that created the universe is, is their God, Allah. And if it doesn't matter what we call God, then you should encourage them to use this biblical name, the house of God of Jacob, the Lord God of Israel, would be another way to put it. Lots of biblical names like that. And see how accepted they are to call him Allah, the God of Jacob. Probably won't happen. So this is that little video that I downloaded, and it's only a minute or two. Uh, and this deals with the Ezekiel vision that's in the last nine chapters of the book of Ezekiel. And it takes a while to start. And the hand of God was upon the prophet Ezekiel, and he brought him from Babylon to Jerusalem and placed him on a high mountain. There he was shown a vision of the future temple that will bring peace and harmony to the world. In the vision, an angel spoke to Ezekiel and said, Son of man, pay attention to all that I am about to show you and teach it to the house of Israel. The angel took Ezekiel through the entire temple and measured its chambers and courtyards, its walls and its gates. stand four great chambers, 
the upper chambers are his arms and the lower chambers his legs. Surrounding him is the Temple Mount, his holy space. The Temple Mount of the future temple will be 36 times larger than that of Solomon's temple or the second temple, nearly one and a half square miles, large enough to comfortably hold two million people. Okay, so that, when we get to Ezekiel 40, I want you guys to look surprised when I show you this video again, please, but we're going to look at it again, because there's a lot going on in there that we don't have time to elaborate on now. But 36 times larger than Solomon's temple. That temple has never been built. We never had a square temple. We never had one that huge, taking up that big of a chunk of real estate, but we will. So, do I think that this is the one that we've been referring to, that the abomination of desolation will be, uh, will blaspheme, and the one that I said they're doing all, of, all of the casting of metals and pounding silvers? I don't believe so. I believe the Antichrist is going to defile the, the coming world leader's temple, and then the Lord Jesus Christ will oversee, the Messiah will, will uh, build this one, at his second coming, but we'll see. It won't be very long and we'll know for certain, right? We may be watching it from the mezzanine, but... So, main point to take away today is that the Bible never confuses Israel and the church. But if you're listening to Christian radio or TV, you're going to find a lot of it. Galatians 3.27, For all of you who were baptized into Christ... Okay, now we have a category of people... Those who were baptized into Christ, baptized by the Holy Spirit, have clothed yourselves with Christ. We're talking about believers, Christians. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither male nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. So, we are talking about born-again, saved Christians. That's what he's including here. Baptizing with Christ, in Christ. And in that category, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female. Now, I took a shower this morning. I can tell you that I am a male still, even though I'm born again. And the ladies are still females. What he's saying is there is no positional difference between any of those groups. He's not saying that a Greek person loses his Greekness. He's not saying that an that a Albanian stops being an Albanian. He's saying that whether you're Greek or Jew, in your position, in your religion, we're all one in Christ Jesus. That's the point he's making here. And so don't try, and Paul other places, you know, whatever position you were in when you get saved, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, stay there. You know, if you were a slave, stay a slave. If you were a slaveholder, stay a slaveholder, that kind of a thing. Same thing here. So what happens to the church? I'm glad you asked. Jesus says in John 14, 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Why do you suppose Jesus said that? Because their hearts were troubled, right? He just told them he's going to leave. Believe in God, believe also in me. That's another deity claim. If you ever hear me say, you guys believe in God, you should believe in Dave too. Blasphemy. If, this, if Jesus is not an infinite deity, then that's blasphemy, what he said right there. Comparing himself to God. And the Jews stoned him for it, or were crucified him for it. Verse 2, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you, where? To my Father's house. He's in the Father's house. I will receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Can you see that this is a prophet? I mean, this is a promise of Jesus to take us to the Father's house. Not to be on planet Earth. Uh, during the Great Tribulation. First Thess 4.17, Paul says, Then you 
you who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. This proceeds when Jesus comes back at the second coming and his feet actually touch the Mount of Olives and split the mountain, split the city into a huge big gap. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul gives a whole bunch that we must be changed. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Well, what's he mean by the last trumpet here? Because we still have the book of forward, book of Revelation to look forward to. And there's at least seven trumpets there. Well, the last trumpet is a phrase. Everywhere in the Old Testament, every time before they got ready to move, whether they'd been parked there for years or whether they'd been parked for days, when they got ready to move out, they had a series of trumpet blasts. One was, get ready, today's the day, we're going to move. Next one would be, gather your flocks and your sheep, that kind of a thing. Get your backpack on. Get ready. And then they would have a last trumpet when they actually started marching out. And it's the same for us. The last trumpet for the church is when we're called to the Father's house. And we will be caught up together. Uh, if somebody comes up to you and they say, well, the Bible never says there's a rapture. The words never use it. Well, the, the Bible never uses the word Bible either. The Bible never uses the word Trinity either. And the Bible does use the word caught up. And that in the rapture, in the Latin Vulgate, is where we get the word rapture from it. So you're just using the long translation. It's actually harpazo here in the Greek, but rapturo in the Latin, when we're caught up, seized up, snatched up. And Ellen's telling me I'm running over. So 1 Thess 4.13, what happens to the church? Matthew 29, uh, 8, 19, 28, and Jesus said to them, Truly I say to that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, thrown in the, in the temple of God, I might add, you also will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's repeated of their places. So can you see that here Jesus is making a distinction between the tribes of Israel and his followers? Revelation 21.10, Holy City, Jerusalem, came down out of heaven from God, verse 12, with 12 gates, ellipsis, the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were named the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So you've got the gates have the tribe names, and the foundation stones have the apostles' names on them. It's like, I always struggle with this. It seems to me that it's reversed. To me, my logical way of thinking, I would have think the 12 tribes were before the apostles, so you'd put the 12 tribes down as the foundation stones, and then the way to get into the temple is through the Lamb, so I would have the 12 apostles' names on the gates. But the Lord doesn't let me proofread this stuff or correct it. <laughs> so that's what it says. But there's a distinction, even at the very end, between the 12 tribes. And uh, so there's lots of ways to become biblically in, uh, in uh, the Old Testament way. Several ways to become a Jew. One, you could be born into Israel. You could marry into Israel. Ruth did that, lots of others. Uh, four brides, Gentile brides in the lineage of Christ. You could be taken captive as a slave. Uh, you could be bought in the marketplace uh, by a slave from a neighboring country, and you become a Jew. Or you could be adopted into being a Jew. So you know, if you were a slave, a foreigner slave, and you wanted to, to follow Yahweh, you could do that. Well, what do you think of those five ways? Every one applies to us. We are born again, a new creation. We are married. We are betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says we've been taken captive. He also says we've been bought at a price. And we are also called adopted sons. So every way that you could become an Old Testament Jew as a foreigner applies to us as Christians, it seems. 
National Israel was unwilling, but all believers are willing. Matthew 22, verse 3, Jesus says, And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Doesn't sound to me like they... I'm not, I'm not sure which button I clicked there. Uh, doesn't sound to me that they were rejected because they were not elect. It sounds like they were unwilling to come. That's the point Jesus made. And I tell you, think love relationship. This salvation is about a love gift. It's about a love marriage. And that has to be bidirectional. There has to be, you can't impose your love on somebody else. We call that cosmic rape. John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So there is a requirement in order to be get born again that you must receive him. And this word in the Greek, received, is a very interesting word. It's one of the first ones they teach us when we're studying Greek. It's hard. Um, uh, oh, shoot, it went away. Um, but it means it'll drop in in a minute. Uh, it's not harpazo. <laughs> we already went through that. But this word receive can mean, in the English, we, we use it for, uh, I'm going to have to come back to that. So Matthew 23, 37 says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jesus speaking, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. So this sounds to me very, very much like Jesus Christ wants the residents of Jerusalem to be saved. He's willing. He's desiring. He wants to gather them together. Why aren't they saved? They were unwilling. So lambano is this Greek word, received him. And lambano is a very interesting word. Uh, and I like the trans one of the translations for it is apprehend. And I especially like that because of the two English uses of the word apprehend, which is a direct translation of this receive. If I told you that I was going, I was in a hurry, I was going 80 miles an hour through town, and the CHP apprehended me. I would mean by that they physically seized me, they jerked me out of the car, handcuffed me, and locked me up. They apprehended me. But at the same time, if I told you I was teaching my Sunday school class and they couldn't get it and they couldn't get it and they finally apprehended it, you would understand that I meant that they, can, they agreed in their mind, they grasped the point, and they understood it. And both of them are true here, I believe, of this word received. This lambano is a very interesting word and it, we have to apprehend him in both ways that we mean apprehend. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So grace is what says, grace is what saves us, grace is the gift of God, and we receive that through faith. Anyone who's willing starts way back in 1 Kings 4, uh, 8, verse 41. Also concerning the foreigner who's not of thy people Israel, when he comes from a far country for their name's sakes, for they will hear of the great name uh, and thy mighty hand and thine outstretched arm. When he comes and prays towards this house, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all which the foreigner calls to thee in order to all the peoples of the earth may know thy name to fear thee and do the, thy people Israel that they may know that this is the house which I have built called by thy name. This is Solomon speaking. And he's saying that people are going to stream for willingly wanting to come and worship. And that's the opportunity that's available to everybody. And anybody that is willing can find peace. Isaiah 9, 6, our Christmas verse. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Speaking of Jesus Christ. Micah 5.4, and they will arise and shepherd his flock 
in the strength of Yahweh, Hashem, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one, speaking of Jesus, will be our peace. So he is going to rise. Christ is going to rise. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd in, in John chapter 10 and his flock in the strength of Jehovah, in the majesty of the name of Jehovah, his God. So can you see this is Micah 5.4? It's talking about Messiah, his messianic promise, that he would come in the name and the power, and he is our peace. That's another interesting study, if you want to go through it, about who this one is, the Prince of Peace. Ephesians 2.14, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Believe me, there is hostility from the Jews. There was in the first century, and it's continued on. Because of this dividing wall of hostility, they used to have a sign on the holy place, there, and there's still one there at the Temple Mount. You go past this at risk of death of yourself. You don't, you're not allowed to go everywhere you want if you're a Gentile. And it's this wall of hostility. And Jesus Christ destroyed that barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Interesting Bible study. I say don't squint. The complete article follows after the the end slide. But Jack Kelly was a really good Bible scholar. And he says, what does the Bible say about Israel and the church? And I clipped some out. So we're just going to look at the clip. Someone wrote to ask my opinion about several theories he's read concerning the relationship between the church and Israel. He asks, are the two really the same, or are they supposed to be different? Here's my response. Here's Jack Kelly's response. The misguided effort to blend the church and Israel into one entity continues. First, it was replacement theology, the false teaching that because of their rejection of Jesus as their Messiah, God has no more use for, for Israel. Instead, he has transferred to the church all of the promises they had formerly made to them. According to this view, the rebirth of Israel in 1948 was nothing more than an accident of history, not the fulfilling of prophecy. Uh, they say the only future for Israel is through the church. The Hebrew Roots Movement takes a different road to reach the same mirror image of the same destination. They claim the Gentile church has gone way off track, you might be right about that, having been contaminated with Greek and Roman paganism. They advocate a return to the Jewish roots of the church by keeping the law, the dietary restrictions, the feasts of Israel, etc., like the original disciples did. Remember, the original disciples were 100% Jewish. In other words, to become Torah observant. That was denied in Acts 15. They say the only future of the church is through Israel. Then there's the view called remnant theology that distinguishes between national Israel and spiritual Israel, which they call remnant Israel. According to this view, remnant Israel is a spiritual body just like the church. They interpret Romans 11, 17 through 19 to say the church has been grafted in to remnant Israel and they are now one and the same. These positions all disregard the fact that in creating his church, God took some who were formerly Jews and some who were formerly Gentiles and made one new man out of the two, Ephesians 2, 14 and 16. Being made new means neither group remains as they were. Paul clarified this in Galatians 3, 28, when he said to the church, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Yes, we are all Abraham's seed, but that doesn't mean we're all Israel. Abraham met many sons. Remember, about a dozen of them. In Genesis 12, 3, God said that all the families, clans, and tribes of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. The purpose of this study is to demonstrate that no matter how some people try to redefine things, Israel and the church are separate entities in God's view and were never intended to become one. Comparing the two, we will see that each has a different origin, a unique purpose, and a separate destiny. And he goes on from there. And I, again, I would turn you back to John chapter 14, verse 17, where Jesus says, the Spirit is in with you and will be, meaning yet future, 
will be in you. At Acts chapter 2. So, in closing, Mike Gendron, a great apologist, a great witnesser to the Roman Catholics, says that the world has two kinds of people. Unbelievers and believers. Unbelievers are spiritually dead. Believers are alive in Christ. Unbelievers under God's wrath. Believers are under God's grace. Unbelievers are guilty. Believers are forgiven. Unbelievers are condemned. We're justified. Controlled by the flesh. We live by the flirt. They are enemies of God. We are children of God. They are in bondage to sin. We are set free by Christ. They are separated from God. We are reconciled to God, Romans 5. They are destined for hell. We are destined for heaven. Two kinds of believers. The whole universe now is divided into two camps, and only two. Israel is not a separate group. There's only believers and unbelievers. Only two groups. So, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16.30 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Not this. Boy, you were this close to getting into heaven and then I checked these photos of you on Facebook. <laughs> so, Dr. Lloyd, Lloyd, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, We must never say that it is our faith that saves us. It is the Lord Jesus who saves you. If you say that your faith saves you, your faith has become a work. And I might add, you can lose your faith. And you have something to boast about. Faith does not save us. It's through faith that we are saved. Faith is only the instrument. It's not the cause of justification. So it's like, you know, I put a hammer, a nail on the board, and I hit it. Was it the hammer that drove the nail in? No, I swung the hammer, right? <laughs> the hammer is just an instrument between me and that nail. I could also use my nail gun. I could also use my screw gun. But it's the nail and me. I'm the one that drives it in. God's the one that saves us. And he saves it by the shed blood of Jesus Christ so that he can remain just. Augustine said, It is not that we keep his commandments first and that he loves us, but that he loves us and then we keep his commandments. This is that grace which is revealed to the humble, but hidden from the proud. So the transformation that takes place when we become born again, become a child of God. Uh, the illustration I use for folks, I say, imagine all of a sudden that your father became president of the United States. And you're a dirty little urchin, his son. All of a sudden your dad is now president of the United States there is an expectation that you will act like the president's son. And you would want to act like the president's son because you don't want to shine badly on your dad. You don't want to reflect your fallibility onto him. And that's us. We're not sinless, but we wish we were so that we could reflect well on Christ. Now there's only two kinds of men. There's saints and there's ain'ts. Blaise Pascal said... There are only two kinds of men, the righteous who believe themselves sinners and the rest sinners who believe themselves righteous. So this one here, the first one, only two kinds of men, the righteous who believe themselves sinners. That's the point Jesus was making when he said, I tell you the truth, I did not come to save the righteous, but sinners. So another prerequisite for salvation is that you must be a sinner. And if you're self-righteous or religiously righteous, you can't be saved. KJV, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting lives. And I found this. Foundations are very important. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Not like this. I say foundations are important. This is actually a basement construction under Prabhu City Temple uh, Center Temple in Utah. But look, they've got that thing completely supported on posts. So. so the end. Let me close this with a word of prayer and see if I can get out of this program first and close this up and quit. <laughs>